Good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Hurd. I'm Dean of the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, and I'd like to welcome you all to the first part of our webinar titled How to Fix Social Media and Civic Life and Everything Else. We don't lack for ambition here. This two-part event, really a conversation in two parts, is a collaboration with our wonderful colleagues in the College of Information and Computer Sciences. SPS is hosting uh, today's event, and I hope you'll join us for the second part this Thursday, also at 4 p.m., which will be hosted by CICS. Before we start, a few technical matters. Today's session will be recorded and later added to our online video library of resources, but audience cameras and mics will be disabled throughout the, the, the uh, webinar, so you will all be uh, remain anonymous throughout. Closed captions will be available throughout the session. You can toggle your closed caption options at the bottom of your screen view. Also at the bottom of your screen view, there's a Q&A option available. Please feel free to post a question at any time during the session. It will be sent to the meeting host. We hope to get to as many of your questions today as possible. Both of these conversations feature our terrific new colleague, Professor Ethan Zuckerman, whose appointments are in the School of Public Policy, the Department of Communication, and the College of Information and Computer Sciences. This part of the conversation is titled Losing Trust, Taking Action, and moderating today is Distinguished Professor of Public Policy and Political Science, Jane Fountain. Jane? Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, John. I'm really delighted to be here and um, to play any role at all at introducing you to Professor Ethan Zuckerman and his work. Um, I want to introduce Ethan to you. I know that he doesn't like long introductions, uh, but I'm going to make a fairly long introduction because he has a constellation of skills, I know, uh, that are unusual and that are very, very much needed in this problem space. And we have so many quite accomplished alumni with us. I think various parts of his background will, will resonate with many of you. Uh, Professor Zuckerman is um, uh, affiliated with, appointed in the School of Public Policy, in communication and in information. He is also the founder of the Institute for Digital Public Infrastructure. He will be, to reiterate what Dean Hurd said, he will be talking about that more on Thursday. That is a research group that is studying and building alternatives to the existing commercial internet. That is a pretty big lift. He has been doing a series of interviews, a podcast called Reimagining the Internet that you can find. It's a free infomercial, Ethan on YouTube or as a podcast where he's been talking with activists, journalists, entrepreneurs, researchers who have something to say about what's wrong with social media currently and how to fix it. We're very excited about this project and having it based at UMass. He's the author of two books, the book he'll be talking about today and previously uh, a book with the wonderful title Rewire Digital Cosmopolitans in the Age of Connection. Both were published by Norton. In 2005, he co-founded with Rebecca McKinnon, a global blogging community that still exists today. This was the first time I knew about his work or any part of it called Global Voices. That global uh, blogging community is meant to give voice to people mostly in developing countries, emerging countries, who are not likely to have their stories told in the mainstream media. It is still a vital, quite exciting space. And um, it was quite an important development at the time. I would say probably the first of its kind. Ethan also works with a number of social change nonprofits around the world. Before coming to UMass, um, Dr. Zuckerman spent about, about a decade at the MIT Media Lab and the Comparative Media Studies Department is at MIT. He led the Center for Civic Media there. In the decade or so before that, he was at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard. So I'm hoping we have him for more than a decade, but we'll see. There seems to be a decade uh, uh, spatial uh, cycle to these moves. About 20 years ago, we've co-founded Geek Core, which was an international nonprofit for tech transfer to emerging countries focused mainly on small businesses. It was kind of a Peace Corps for geeks. Um, in 1994, before that, 
He, with a group of friends in Williamstown, Mass, out our way, Western Mass, um, built Tripod, which is now a web hosting provider that's part of Lycos. But originally, it was a content site for 20-somethings in the early days of the internet and web. And that was sold in 1999. So again, I say all this because it's impressive, and these are important accomplishments, but also because there are a constellation of skills here, some of which sort of come out in the book um, that are, I truly believe, are going to help move the internet and web, social media, and our country, have I left anything out, forward. Um, Ethan is great at building tech tools. He's great at starting organizations and nonprofits. And he's also wonderful at conceptualizing and deeply insightful about social media and its role, potential as well as actual in society. Um, so the book, Mistrust, um, begins with that alarming word, uh, but after the semicolon, it says, why losing faith in institutions provides the tools to transform them. So without further ado, I'm turning this over to you, Professor Zuckerman. Well, Jane, thank you so much. The uh, exceedingly warm welcome that I just got from you has been sort of typical of my, my UMass experience, uh, which is that um, people are wonderful almost to a fault. Uh, in this case, I'm gonna to object to, to only one part of your intro, which is you've, uh, you've promoted me to doctor, uh, which I, I actually have not earned and don't deserve. I'm, I'm one of those academic edge cases, um, which is I'm someone who is, is lucky enough to, to teach at a terrific university like this uh, without that advanced degree. Uh, and I'm, I'm very grateful uh, for that opportunity. Um, as Jane said, uh, I'm, I'm really going to give sort of a talk in two parts. And, and the talk today is about a lot of this work I was doing over at MIT with Center for Civic Media. That was a center that was focused on this question of how people could use new media and technology to make social change. And so I want to talk about that today. And then um, I want to talk on Thursday about the ways that I'm gonna to try to make social change through changing technology, through social media technology. So if you're disappointed that you don't get um, how to fix social media in this talk, uh, stick around for Thursday, we're gonna work on it then. Um, but in part, because Jane, Jane has heard me talk about the book before, I wanted to talk about a, a different section of it. I actually wanted to start our conversation today in Sicily. Um, and most people in America know very little about Sicily. Um, uh, for, for people who know almost nothing else about um, this largest island in the Mediterranean, um, they know that it's the home of the Sicilian mafia, uh, a, a, an international crime syndicate that um, controlled many of the clandestine and underground industries in the United States um, through the 1950s and 1960s, subject of an enormous uh, amount of Hollywood drama, countless books. Um, but I'm really sort of interested in this question of how the mafia comes about, because it actually turns out to be a story about trust and mistrust. And the mafia, in many ways, is a direct reaction um, to this guy, whose nose, I have to say, is really just extraordinary. As a, as a big guy, I don't like to make fun of uh, a lot of people in images, but that's just a great portrait of Charles III. Um, Charles uh, was one of the many French and Spanish Bourbon kings um, who ended up being enormously influential in European history in the 1700s. And Charles was probably the best of a bad lot. He was a surprisingly smart guy. And while most of the rest of Europe is rushing off to pay attention to the war of Polish succession, Charles III says, you know what? I bet I can conquer Sicily. And he does, he conquers Sicily, he conquers Southern Italy, goes back home to Spain, declares them the kingdom of the two Sicilies and, and basically ignores them. Um, so you have this large chunk of land with only the loosest of government behind it. Uh, there are no appointed administrators. There are no judges. He doesn't do the sorts of things that you would expect to do uh, as, as a conquering empire, building roads, building connections. Instead, he does something very simple. He maintains a correspondence with a number of the powerful figures on the island of Sicily, and he lets each of them know that their neighbors are plotting to kill them. And as a result, he's able to keep Sicily from uniting and overthrowing Spanish rule through what we would now call divide and conquer. 
And this has some really interesting implications as this scholar, Diego Gambetta, explains. Gambetta has written really the book on the Sicilian mafia. So putting aside the Godfather films, this is the guy who actually has sort of looked at the deep history behind it. And what Gambetta says happens is basically this. You're living in Sicily in 1850. You don't trust anybody else. There is really no government to take care of you. And you live sort of in mortal fear that a couple of towns over, they might sweep down and conquer you at any time. And so you have a real problem here. It's very hard to do business. You are raising cattle, you wanna sell them in the next town, but what's to prevent the butcher from ripping you off? What's to prevent him from killing you and taking your cow? There's no legal system that's gonna help you out. And so the answer is you hire someone to protect you. And that's the subtitle of his book, The Business of Private protection. The mafia start not so much as bodyguards, but really more as trust brokers. Their job is to keep things moving smoothly. So in a system where there are no institutions that are functioning, when there's nothing to trust, people start looking for other things to replace those institutions. Normally, you would hope for a court system. Normally, you would hope for a town government. But if you don't have those things, suddenly you get people who try to provide trust where there is none available. Now, obviously, there's some downsides about this, right? We don't generally celebrate the mafia as a good way of doing business. Although the flip side is um, they actually work surprisingly well. There have been a number of scholars who have studied the drug trade in Palermo. It turns out that despite very heavy drug use, um, there's very few overdoses in Palermo. And people speculate that this is because the mafia actually intervenes to keep the quality very, very high. But obviously this is not generally speaking how you wanna run an economy. And in fact, Southern Italy has been a case study for years of the economic damage of not being able to trust, of essentially having to transact mostly within family firms rather than transacting with strangers. But we see this example again and again. Right now, one of the things that we're seeing happen in urban Brazil is armed gangs taking to the streets to create coronavirus lockdowns. And this is because the government of Brazil has actually been so reactive, so on the back foot regarding COVID that the gangs see an opportunity to build their own legitimacy. Look, we're here to protect the people. We're trying to keep you home and keep you free from the disease. Therefore, we have legitimacy that the government might not have. So I'm starting with these dark examples of what a world without trust looks like, a world in which you find yourself hiring the mafia or where street gangs are doing a better job than government to protect people from pandemic because things haven't necessarily been so great lately in the United States. We've had a really rough year between a pandemic that I think many people would agree has not been especially well handled and then an election which has really exposed enormous amounts of weakness in our government system, people are starting to ask this question, should we really have a high degree of faith in the institutions of American life? And what I wanna suggest is that that's actually a great question to ask, but in some ways it's a little late to be asking for it because frankly, what's been going on is a shift in how Americans relate to institutions and how they trust in institutions that's been going on for a very long time. So let me start by sort of making a distinction. When sociologists and other social scientists study trust, they distinguish between interpersonal trust and institutional trust. Interpersonal trust is when I say, hey, do you trust your neighbor? If you leave your wallet in a cafe, do you think someone will return it to you? Would you say that most people can be trusted or you can't be too careful? Those are the sorts of questions that we ask. And that number is actually fairly constant in American life. It's declined a little bit over the last 30 or 40 years, but it's very, very different than what's happened as far as trust in institutions. Trust in institutions we measure with a question like, do you trust the government in Washington to do the right thing all or most of the time? 
And that number peaks around about 1964 during the Kennedy administration. But then it changes rather radically and we're in a very, very different place right now. Over the course of the 1970s, we slide down from having 77% of people say they trust the government all or most of the time down to at the end of the Carter presidency, 26% people trusting the government all or most of the time. We get it back. Trust in government increases under Reagan. It increases quite a bit under Bill Clinton. It has a spike uh, around about 9-11. We rally around the flag. But the problem is we crossed what I think of as the Carter line, the moment where fewer than one in four Americans trust the government. In 2008, we've never gotten it back. Trust all throughout the Obama administration, throughout the Trump administration, averages about 17%. So we've gone from roughly four in five Americans trusting the government to roughly one in five Americans trusting the government to do the right thing. Now, if this were just about government, it would be an interesting trend, but it's not. Actually, what's happened is a collapse of trust in all sorts of different institutions. And this includes the police, church and organized religion, the medical system, public schools, banks, organized labor, newspapers, the criminal justice system, television news, big business. Across the board, these institutions are less trusted than they used to be. And by the way, some of them are much less trusted. The medical system is trusted by 80% of people in 1975. That trust level now is down to about 37%. And as you can imagine, that has enormous implications when we face something like the pandemic. This is also not just a U.S. trend. The U.S. is a significantly mistrustful nation. There's an annual survey done by a group called Edelman um, that looks at both the general population and sort of uh, elite populations, highly educated or, or, or highly networked populations. Um, the U.S. is in the lowest third, but it's by far not the lowest. In fact, depending on who you ask, uh, the U.K., Japan, France, Germany, Ireland, Spain, all pretty consistently come up as less trusting than the U.S. does. Um, so this is a problem that's attacking a lot of advanced economies and a lot of advanced democracies. Possibly the most disturbing data that anyone's put forward on this is Stefan Foa and Sasha Munk, who published a paper in 2017 called Democratic Deconsolidation that sort of went off a little bit like a bomb within the political science community. And they used a very well-known research instrument. It's called the World Value Survey. People ask this of people around the world every few years, but they asked a very specific question do you believe that it's essential to live in a democracy? And then they looked at the answers to that question depending on when you were born. In the United States, if you were born in the 1930s, 75% of those people say, yes, it's absolutely essential to live in a democracy. By the time you get down to the 1970s, when I'm born, you have about 30% of people saying it's essential to live in a democracy. And it's getting closer to 25% with people born in 1980. And this is a trend that seems to be affecting a lot of advanced democracies, places that have been democracies for a long time. Some like Sweden still look relatively healthy, but some of these others look like people are really moving away from a consensus that democracy is the way to run a society. So what's going on here? Well, there's a bunch of hypotheses. One is that we're just smarter than we used to be. We educate a whole lot more people in America than we did in the 1960s. It's pretty common for people to go to work without finishing high school in the 1960s. Now, many, many more people finish high school. Lots more people go into college. We get trained in critical thinking skills. It's possible that we're simply approaching authorities, approaching institutions with a lot more skepticism. It's also possible that we have different information sources. One of the things that changes in the 1970s is that the US press gets a lot more aggressive. Watergate means that the press is now confronting the presidency and taking scalps in the process. And we've had a much more confrontational press ever since then. We have the internet and social media, and maybe it's possible that people are being pushed to question or pushed to doubt. And recently we're finding in ways that are probably extremely unhelpful and extremely worrisome. 
But it's important to remember that this collapse in trust starts happening in the 1970s. That's a moment at which only a few guys who even have grayer beards than I am are using the internet. So it's very hard to blame this entirely on the internet. I think a better way to blame this is that we are seeing at the same time that confidence in institutions falls, a massive rise in inequality uh, within advanced economies and advanced democracies. So in the 1960s, the state in the US is pretty redistributive. It's taxing at very high rates. It's investing a great deal in infrastructures like the highways that people are here sleeping under. Um, and there's a general sense that people's lives are getting better. As inequality increases, there's a lot of people who don't always feel like their lives are getting better. And then finally, I think for me, the most persuasive argument is that as institutions fail, as we see their limitations, we end up not trusting them going forward. And this of course is a, is a testing line for COVID. Uh, and there's a very good chance that confidence in US government and US government's competence is gonna be shaken uh, by the sheer death toll that we've experienced around the COVID pandemic. So why does trust matter? Well, it matters a lot uh, for responding to a crisis. Um, Taiwan has enjoyed really high trust in government since 2014. A new government took over in 2014, was backed by a bunch of activists. It's been highly engaged with the populace. It has a really interesting program that I write about in the book in which citizens get to participate in the government. And they've done a really amazing job at getting the population to comply with COVID. Brazil on the flip side has had a leader uh, who not unlike the US has really minimized COVID and its impact. Uh, and they're facing one of the, the most horrible death tolls around here. But I think it's important to understand that mistrust can, can affect a lot of other systems. And even if you're not directly working on social change, mistrust matters a lot. The caption that I am blocking because I forgot to move it and because I'm big is mistrust is expensive. Um, and the way that I try to explain to people is explaining about the blockchain. Now, please don't panic. It is true. I am coming from a long stint at MIT, uh, but I am not in fact a blockchain enthusiast. I have a very simple diagram that helps people figure out whether or not their business needs a blockchain. I found this has actually worked for me in almost all cases. I I'm interested in the blockchain because it's almost a metaphor for this moment of mistrust. Bitcoin is a currency entirely based on this idea that you shouldn't trust the banks, right? And I would argue that the banks actually do a pretty good job. Visa processes about 1700 transactions per second, doesn't use a ton of energy. Bitcoin transacts a tiny, tiny fraction of that uses an enormous amount of energy. The main difference is that you have to trust Visa. You have to trust their processing network to carry out your transactions. Satoshi Nakamoto, the invisible figure who started Bitcoin was obsessed with trust. So writing about this back in 2009, the root problem with conventional currency is all the trust that's required. The central bank must be trusted. And the history of fiat currencies is full of, of the breach of that trust. Banks must be trusted. So Bitcoin, this strange phenomenon that seems to keep increasing in value, this is basically a bet on trust. And there's a whole bunch of people who say, I don't wanna trust banks or central banks or governments. What I would rather do is trust hackers and programmers and the math and the code. So how much does this mistrust actually cost us? Well, with Bitcoin, you can actually measure it. You can measure what it costs. And the answer is Bitcoin is really, really expensive to run. That little bar there just over my head, that is the energy cost of 100,000 visa transactions. And that big red bar, the much larger one, that is the energy cost of one Bitcoin transaction. And the reason for this is the technology behind it. In Visa, you say, hey, Visa, here's my money. Please give it to the merchant. That's not what happens in Bitcoin. In Bitcoin, you essentially say, hey, everybody out there who is processing Bitcoin transactions, 
I wish to announce that I am giving this money to this person. Would all of you please maintain your ledgers and publish them so that we see that that, uh, that transaction took place? And because that is so vastly more efficient, but it means I don't have to trust a bank, it actually uses enough electricity to take my fat butt in my electric car 4,700 kilometers per transaction. So for me, this is a very tangible, physical way of thinking. We're really so mistrustful that we're willing to sort of burn energy as a way of essentially saying, we don't trust these institutions so much that we would rather transact business this way instead. Another way to think about this is a company like eBay. eBay makes money because it shows up on the internet, which is a whole lot like Sicily in the 1850s. It's really hard to know whether the guy who's selling you a collectible Pez dispenser is just gonna take your money and run with it. And so eBay does a whole bunch of stuff. It creates a rating system. So if you run away, your rating's gonna go down. It creates an escrow system. They'll hold the Pez dispenser until they get the cash and then they'll send them both in the different directions. They end up creating PayPal. So there's a payment system that goes with all of this that's reversible. eBay's $35 billion valuation is basically what it costs them to solve the trust problem. So mistrust is really expensive. It makes it really hard for us to do business. But that's not what I really care about. I really care about mistrust and civics. What I care about is that if you don't trust the government, you end up stalled in both of the major ways that you might consider making social change. If you don't trust the government to actually take care of you, to pass laws, to do the right thing, voting becomes something of a meaningless exercise. And weirdly enough, so does protest. Unless the goal of your protest is to throw the government out entirely, and that's not what the goal is most of the time, usually your goal is to influence the government. But if you feel like the government can't really make change, then protest has to have a very different sort of meaning. So I started looking at this question and tried to ask myself the question, are there other ways that we can imagine people making social change at a moment where they have very low trust in those institutions? Because if we don't do it, what we're likely to have is disengagement, people who don't want to be interested in these processes. So what I've ended up saying to people is that it's okay to lose faith in your institutions when they're not working for us. What's not okay is to give up entirely. And so my work has been trying to help people figure out how they might make social change, whether they see themselves as an institutionalist or as an insurrectionist. Now, I use these terms when I started writing this book about five years ago, well before what happened in January 6th. And in fact, one of the questions Jane may ask me is how I think about the insurrection on the 6th in terms of this analysis. But let me say, I'm borrowing these terms from the author Chris Hayes, who used them about 10 years ago, and he meant them in a very specific way. For Chris, institutionalists are people who wanna see progress through strong institutions. And if you wanna make change, you join those institutions. You work in a political campaign, you join a congressional office, you write to your congressman or senator, you join a big business and you try to make it ethical and you try to make it better. But there is some group of people whose reaction to that is to say, are you crazy? Have you seen our institutions lately? They're not working very well. We either need a better institution, radically better, we need a new one entirely, or we should just get rid of these institutions and have no institutions at all. And what my work the last few years has been is trying to take insurrectionists seriously and to think about how insurrectionists might be able to make social change. The model that I propose is borrowed from my friend Larry Lessig. And Lessig says that there's four basic ways that we regulate society. We pass laws so that we do some things and we don't do some things. And if we don't follow the laws, we get arrested. But we also regulate societies through things like social norms. We tend to follow particular behaviors. When I give this talk live and in person, I point out that anyone could stand up and yell at me and simply derail this talk. Generally speaking, people don't do that.
Now, what's interesting is that since we're actually doing this on Zoom, you're actually being prevented uh, from interrupting the talk by code. Computer code, technologies, architectures, they also constrain our behavior. Right now, they're preventing you from, uh, from, from standing up and interrupting the talk. They're not preventing you from logging off. Um, but code can also be a way that we regulate behavior. And finally, we use markets to make behaviors cheap or expensive. And my big point in this book is that if you turn this model inside out, these all become paths toward change. You can make change through law, but you can do it a lot of other ways as well. So even during the Trump administration, where there was not a lot of momentum uh, for work on the climate crisis, you saw people trying to use markets to make electric cars very popular or to try to popularize rooftop solar um, or to see wind power come on and become a very substantial part of our market system. Now, these also have help from the legal system. They also have help from social norms. Electric cars become cool. It becomes cool to have solar in your house but this is primarily the market lever. A lot of my students are really interested in the tech lever. And one way to understand how code can make change is to think about privacy. There was a big blow up over privacy under Edward Snowden, uh, but even under the Obama administration, we didn't see many guarantees of privacy. What we have seen are folks like this programmer, Moxie Marlinspike, stepping up and saying, look, I can write an app for my mobile phone called Signal, which will make it basically impossible for the NSA to read my messages. And by the way, if WhatsApp starts using this technology, their technology also can't be read by the NSA. Code is a fascinating form of change because someone, you know, not necessarily all that well-connected or all that powerful can actually build something that might change the landscape around something like privacy for more than a billion people. A lot of my work is on the relationship between laws and between code. And much of the book, Mistrust, looks at what's the same and what's different in the US since the civil rights movement. And one of the things that the civil rights movement took advantage of was a moment where the Supreme Court in the United States was really excited as using law as a way to advance equality. And one of the reasons that it was so important at that point was that there was not a lot of public support for equality, whereas right now we're seeing a lot more public support for gay and lesbian equality. So when you look at the Supreme Court and its relationship to social norms, in 1967, when Loving versus Virginia legalizes interracial marriage, fewer than 20% of Americans would be willing to vote and say, yes, of course, black and white people should be able to get married. By the time that we get over to Oberfelga being legal, you've got more than 60% of Americans saying that equal marriage for gays and lesbians should be on the books. What's happening these days is that norms seem to be leading laws rather than the other way around. And so things like cultural activism, Ellen DeGeneres becoming a, a major cultural figure, a wave of TV shows uh, featuring queer characters and queer hosts, this may have a lot to do with how law ends up changing and how we end up with equality being enshrined. And I think norms are incredibly important when we understand a movement like Black Lives Matter or Defund the Police or Me Too. These are movements that are often norms first. They're trying to change hearts and minds. And to loop this all back for a close, I wanna share with you a movement that I care about very deeply, um, which is called Adio Piso. That stands for uh, goodbye Piso. Piso is the price that people in Sicily have to pay to the mafia, still to this day. And it's a movement that starts because a bunch of university graduates in Palermo in 2005 decide that they wanna start a pub and they're building the spreadsheet for their new business. And someone points out that they've gotta put in a thousand bucks a month to pay off the mafia. They have to put in Piso as a line in their budget projections. And they end up deciding that they're gonna put the business on hold for the moment. What they're actually going to do is start a campaign of cultural change. And they start posting signs all over Palermo that say people who pay the piso are a people without dignity. 
And this starts getting people to come out of the woodwork and say, you know what? I'd be afraid to do it by myself, but if we do it as part of a movement, I'm willing to stop paying the piso. And so you now have in Palermo, a supermarket all filled with suppliers who don't pay the piso. They supply a set of restaurants that are not willing to pay the piso. There's now a travel bureau where you can travel to Sicily with Adio Piso and they will put you up in accommodations that are not ending up supporting the mafia. And for me, this is what's super interesting. I'm seeing young movements focusing first on that thought change, on that norms change. So the point that I tried to make in this book is that it doesn't matter so much whether you're an institutionalist or an insurrectionist, whether you're working inside or outside of these institutions, which of these levers you choose to use, what matters is this idea that you can actually be effective in changing the world. Because I'm a big believer that mistrust is fuel. You can channel it through change, but if it's manipulated, if it's misused, it's incredibly corrosive and it could actually cost us the democracy that we have. Now for me, my audio piso, which I'm gonna talk about in the next talk, looks at one of the institutions that's become incredibly important to us in the last decade, which is social media and this notion of online public spaces. And I'm actually an enormous believer that we could do better, but much like with Adio Piso, the first thing we actually have to do is make a conceptual shift. We have to make a normative change before we make the technical and legal changes. So that's where I would love to leave this for now. Uh, I hope someone is still on this call and that you didn't take my norms provocation to all get off. Um, but thank you so much for listening. And uh, Jane, if you're still there, if I haven't lost you entirely, um, let's have a conversation. Okay. Um, uh, let me just say that there are some questions uh, in the box. So maybe our conversation uh, should go uh, right over. Let me let me just by way of uh, because I'm a professor and I have to ask questions and have yeah. conversation. Say I'm I'm hoping that maybe through the medium of these questions from our alumni, you can talk a little bit about because you have so much experience with them. What makes some social movements sustainable? What makes some social movements able to scale up? We yeah. have these eruptions of, you know, intense interest. And then if they burn out like a meteor, people become more despondent, maybe more mistrustful, uh, uh, more apathetic. So it seems that one thing we want in the civic space are things that actually uh, yeah. are going to work. Um, but should, should we maybe move to, um, because we have a fair number of questions here. Well, Is that okay? Well, and let's, let's, Answer that really quickly, and then let's let's go into the questions because it's such a great question. And I'll say, um, the lab that I had at MIT for for the last almost ten years spent a lot of time inviting in activists and sort of talking to people who were involved with movements that you know could take decades. Um, we had a bunch of people in our lab from Venezuela uh, who had been fighting for Venezuelan democracy all through Chavez and post Chavez. And the thing that I sort of noticed over time is that the emotion that tends to get people into activism is, is anger, right? It's frustration. Mm -hmm. Something's broken, something's wrong. It's a very powerful emotion, but it's not a very sustainable emotion. Um, people have a hard time staying angry for a long time. And the people who, who don't have trouble staying angry are the ones you wanna stay away from. The successful movements um, seem to be the ones that, that start with anger and then move towards support and joy and love. And it's actually much more about people who deeply care for each other and are support supporting each other through the process. I would say the most amazing example of this that I've seen recently uh, were the survivors of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas shootings. So you had these very young people um, coming out of this horrific trauma and you saw them really joining together and defending each other and sort of caring for each other. And I think that's where that group of students found this energy, which you could imagine being coming from a, a place of profound anger and fear, very quickly turning things into, into more positive energy. 
That's, that's, that's great. It's terrifically helpful. Um, and I think we'll cycle back on some of those meta questions. Um, so the first question uh, um, was from Howard Breslau, who just uh, said on the list of countries, he did not see Israel. So the list of countries, high trust, low trust, um, were they intentionally left off? Are it, they just so it's, there? it's, you know, this is Edelman's data. Uh, okay. Edelman is probably not polling in Israel. So I don't have a good answer for you. Um, I will say that there's a lot of different trust data out there that we use. Um, the World Values Survey uh, is one of the biggest ones. It has questions mm -hmm. both on institutional trust as well as interpersonal trust. Uh, and Israel's been in for at least a couple of waves of the survey. Um, I think this is one of the things. We, we don't have a good empirical measure for trust. We have some pretty good empirical measures for mistrust. Um, we know that in highly mistrustful societies, people don't pay their taxes uh, because they don't see any, any reason to do it, nor do they think there are gonna be any consequences for it. Um, but as far as measuring high trust, we tend to do it via poll data. Uh, and that tends to be the, the Edelman polls, uh, Pew and Gallup polls in the US, um, and, uh, and the World Values Survey. So it's definitely something you could look at there, but I, I don't have those stats off the top of my head. Yeah, definitely. Um, I should just interject that talking with Pip and Norris and Joe Nye when they yeah. were working on these books on trust, I've always thought of trust as curvilinear. Mm -hmm. You don't want too much trust. Those are the poor, naive people who you know don't have the requisite amount of skepticism. So I think we're talking about this a sweet spot optimum right optimum yeah. level of trust not too much not too little one of the highest uh, and countries, one of the highest trust Sorry. countries right now is is china and um there's a lot of controversy over that the, the very cynical version says who the heck is going to tell a foreign researcher that they don't trust the government right that seems like a stupid thing to do i i think a more intelligent way of looking at it is to say life in China is getting better for a lot of people. Uh, and, and there's a huge economic upswing. And there is a sense in which the Chinese government's trade-off of economic growth for stability seems to be something that many Chinese people would sign off on. That's certainly been our observation studying social media. But I agree with you, a society that's entirely too trusting is a society where people get away with all sorts of nonsense. Um, so that is absolutely the paradox. So the Nordic countries are very trusting. It's probably because they're very well governed. Uh, right now, China and India and Indonesia are very high in trust. That may have more to do with it with a weaker or less mature democracy. But we're hitting a point in, in Europe and the US where we may be hitting such low trust levels that it's actually very hard to, to do things productively with government. Yes. This next question actually gets right at this point. Yeah. One of the things that China is certainly doing is exploiting problems in the West to say, you see, our system is superior. So just get over it, you democratic societies and uh, come, yep. join us, right? So I'm, I'm assuming you can see these. Yeah, I'm reading it right now. So, so th this is a question that, um, is it possible that it being essential to live in a democracy is falling because of Chinese or Russian propaganda? Um, it's a cool question. Um, I'm gonna suggest that, that the answer is probably not. And, and here's my reason for probably not. People in my field did an enormous amount of research on the influence of Russian campaigns on Facebook mm -hmm. around 2016. And while there's definitely evidence that Russian disinformation was there, there is not a ton of evidence that Russian disinformation was a pivotal factor in the 2016 elections. And in fact, in some ways you can argue that Russian disinformation made it much harder to see domestic disinformation. Um, that there's been a lot of homegrown disinformation uh, as we've seen around the 2020 election where we've had really almost like a bifurcation of reality. Um, I'm not sure that the sort of social media manipulation that we've seen is actually all that powerful. 
I would also note that a lot of those countries that are seeing that decline are countries like Sweden and New Zealand, which are not exactly on the Russian or Chinese radar as far as sort of destroying trust. So what I would say is uncomfortably, I think this is more a symptom of being in an advanced democracy than a symptom of, uh, of outside involvement. Um, otherwise, I'd expect to see it as, as a much clearer U.S. signal and, and not so clearly across a lot of advanced democracies. Yeah. The, you know, Ethan, it does seem that the mismatch between what our large formal institutions are optimized to do and the problems that they're trying to grapple with, when that gets out of alignment, people say they're not solving these problems. They're not solving the problems of race. They're not solving the problems of the future of work. I may lose my job. I've lost my job. My economic prospects are going down. I'm going to, I don't know, go do something else. Hopefully not join a far right militia. But um, the next question from Peter McAvoy, and we have a lot of them, so we'll have to move with alacrity here, is about uh, moderation. Uh, and this, this gets to something that may be coming down the pike. To what extent will people be able to go online without a moderator approving their post? Um, he talks about his experience. Uh, uh, Peter, that's, that's actually, it's a great question for what I'm going to talk about Thursday. And, and just to sort of talk about that a little bit, one of the things I would point out is that it's a little bit crazy that Facebook has over 2 billion users and tries to have a rule book that it implies to all of them the same way. Um, Your conversation in South Hadley might need different rules than the conversations that are happening in Myanmar right now under the coup government. Uh, But right now, Facebook has a set of rules. Uh, And it is worth asking the big question, and this is sort of my my adio piso question, like why the heck do we do it this way? Why isn't your discussion group run by people in South Hadley? And why aren't you part of the people who decide who gets to speak or not? Um, That's how we do this in normal society, right? We actually have, you know, groups and we become parts of them and we're responsible for the governance of them. Social media is this very strange space where we've actually kind of farmed out that responsibility to these very big companies. And and in some ways we're not responsible for governing them ourselves. So I'm gonna talk a little bit on a first day about why I think it's so critical that we build social media in a different way and that we actually have some control over the governance of it. In the meantime, looking at the power of something like Facebook to determine what's allowable and what's not allowable speech um, should give us some pause. Um, That's a really challenging thing to do. And these are not decisions being made by by lawyers or Supreme Courts. They're being made by poorly paid content moderators reading a three-room binder somewhere in the Philippines. It's a very tough situation. Interesting. So think people standard oil circa 1920, 21, and that's the Facebook of of today. Doesn't necessarily have to be that way. The next question is, is leads right from the other. So are we Are we, Ethan, are we at the mercy of social engineers? We talked about laws, norms, markets, and now code. Yeah. So so that phrase, social engineers, often gets applied to thinkers like like Cass Sunstein, um, who are trying to figure out how within the framework of existing institutions to sort of nudge our behavior in one direction or another. Um, I would say that smart activists are absolutely engineers in the same sort of ways. They're trying to figure out how to make an idea go viral, how to persuade people to sort of pick up something and sort of join a cause. Um, But I would say in in many ways, we've always been um, facing a war of of battling social engineers. Um, You know, as long as we've had uh, a public sphere, which is to say a public trying to counterbalance a monarchy, We've had people trying to figure out how you build a movement and how you try to pressure things. What I would say is that the toolkit has just expanded radically right now. And maybe that feeling of, well, we're all being pushed around by social engineers. um, I think maybe that's an invitation to sort of understand how these tools work. How are these kids so smart about trying to move opinion through memes and through social media? And, and how do we sort of understand those cases where maybe we are being manipulated uh, and we need to triangulate our way towards truth? 
That's, that's great. And uh, maybe that also has a relationship to the COVID conspiracy. I know you've studied conspiracies, Ethan, and QAnon among them. Yeah, this is yeah. not about QAnon, but why is the COVID conspiracy? Well, I guess it is a little bit about- Yeah, well, the two, the two have merged. Megan is asking this question about why um, conspiratorial thinking about COVID has, has caught on. Um, so we can talk about it a little bit from information environments, right? We can talk about this idea that um, the anti-vax community has gotten very, very good at using online spaces and making their case. Um, we can talk about QAnon, which has been this sort of unprecedented conspiratorial movement. Um, mm -hmm. We probably haven't seen anything like it since maybe the John Birch Society in the 1950s. Um, but I actually think we also have to look at politics. Um, one of the reasons that COVID mis- and disinformation has been so successful is that the president picked it up and advanced it. Uh, and when you actually look at resistance to taking the COVID vaccine, we talk a lot about resistance in communities of color. Now, Black communities have a really good reason to be suspicious of the government giving them a shot, you know, in the Tuskegee experiment. I mean, we've got a terrible history around this. But white Republicans are refusing the shot at 55% as opposed to, you know, uh, black Republicans and Democrats at, at 30%. So we can blame a lot on social media. But part of why I wrote this book is that I wanted people to sort of understand this is a really deep social trend. And we're seeing political parties saying, hey, I'm the party of mistrust. I'm gonna tell you not to trust the media, not to trust the medical establishment, not to trust the government, trust me personally. And that's turned out to be an incredibly effective philosophy to get elected. It's not a great philosophy from which to govern, but it's been enormously successful because what it's really building on is 40 years of grievance and 40 years of sort of built up lack of trust in these institutions. It can make it very powerful. That's great. And for those of you who haven't yet read the book, there is a section, a, a, a brief section, but an important section on the work of Hannah Arendt and the way that you use, uh, you can't believe every, anything, uh, uh, everyone's lying all the time as a form of uh, control. Political strategy. Yeah. Uh, so it's, there's a lot there. The next question is a very interesting one. Um, it's a long question, Ethan, um, but this is a question about your process of image curation. Anne is asking why all these images, why not uh, words? What is your decision process around this? You're giving a talk, you're using, you're influencing us right now. So, yeah. so um and a part of it, I, I think, is maybe more of a, of a trend in sort of presentation styles. Um, I give a lot of talks to non-academic audiences. And um, what's become much more common in those talks is to try not to hit people with a wall of text. And so often we will use images as a, a placeholder. Um, we use them also as cues to ourself. I have to remember the things that I want to say in this talk. I'm not actually doing this talk with notes. And so in many cases, I'm sort of using the image to remind me uh, of the point that I want to make. Sometimes they're illustrative. Sometimes they're more conceptual in space. Um, the CC piece of it is more laziness on my part. Uh, sometimes I'm adding new slides into a slide deck. I added a bunch of images from Wikipedia today and didn't put the proper licensing information on them. I generally try to get um, CC licenses, particularly when I'm using photos from Flickr to do it. Um, you know, I think talks are their own form of performance and um, people try a bunch of different techniques on them. Um, because I'm not always talking to the academic audiences, um, I generally feel like I can have a, a bit more flexibility uh, in what I'm doing as far as the imagery. Uh, and yeah, sometimes I'm, I'm making jokes or making puns associated uh, with it as a way of trying to make the experience of, of listening to me for, for 30 minutes of an hour, um, you know, an easier thing to do. Okay. So here's a question uh, from someone who's anonymous. Um, this is an important question to, to address. Uh, is the fact uh, that BLM 
was being started in 2013 under Obama, being based upon Marxist values, do you see that BLM was based on a lie that police are hunting down black people, data suggests otherwise, and that BLM was an effort to destabilize America and to insert Marxist policies? Yeah, that's not how I understand BLM. Um, I think the way that I would understand BLM is that we have seen communities of color much more aggressively policed than white communities. We have seen confrontations between black people in particular, black men in particular, um, ending in death much more often uh, than confrontations between white people and police. Um, my lab at MIT actually uh, did a bunch of quantitative research uh, and looked at over 400 instances where unarmed black people were killed by police. Um, the vast majority of these were instances that nobody heard about. Um, they got one or two lines in a newspaper and they disappeared from view. What Black Lives Matter did more than anything else was make clear that these aren't purely isolated instances, this is a problem of structural racism in America. And it actually turns out, we actually demonstrate this in our paper, that once you name this, once you name a phenomenon, you make it possible for people to talk about it in a different way. Before the Black Lives Matter movement, people talked about this was a highly regrettable incident. Once you name it, people start talking about it as a problem. And what we've seen in the wake of Black Lives Matter is a move towards police body cams. There's a great paper out um, that, um, this is not Omar Wasso papers. I, I apologize, I found it through my friend Omar Wasso at Princeton, but it demonstrates that um, communities that have had strong Black Lives Matter presences have had fewer deaths at the hand of the police, uh, of Black men in particular. So I would say that this is a, a real and true phenomenon um, that it was important to name and sort of put out there. I would go further and say in a lot of my talks, when I talk about insurrectionist movements, when I talk about movements that are looking at an institution that really needs fundamental change, I often talk about the defund the police movement. Defund the police is a true insurrectionist movement. It's essentially saying the police in this specific community are so mistrusted by the population that we have to find a way to start from scratch. We have to cut the police funding and we have to put some other sort of form of public safety in place. Uh, so no, I don't think this is a Marxist backdoor. I suspect you're going to disagree with me because you're going to assume that I'm a Marxist university professor. Um, but I actually think BLM uh, is a very reasonable reaction to a very deep-seated problem. Mm. I can also say that um, I've, I've been very impressed with the strategic sophistication and the extraordinary discipline of young Black Lives Matters uh, leaders and organizers and the extraordinary control over which they have proceeded to introduce topics to get them into discussion. I don't see a, 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 a Marxist derivation unless you mean greater equality uh, for people. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'll go on the record. I mean, I'm really a centrist and I'm a pragmatist. Uh, and so my views fall where they, where they fall. Um, Massachusetts has just passed a police reform bill. Some people may want to look at it. Cities and towns are also grappling with, with police reform. And just in, in the spirit of Ethan's talk, how exactly we want this institution to work um, with the community and, and solving problems. We have to break, uh, so maybe we get one more. Um, let's, let's, try, let's try this last question from Kinsung because it's really interesting. Great. Um, so Kinsung suggests that I'm, I'm hinting that a decline in trust is an emergent pro property of an advanced democracy. Is, is it possible that both true and false information are more common? Um, is disinformation leading us here? So what, what, what I think I'm actually trying to argue is that in an advanced democracy, maybe we do a better job of seeing what institutions are, are doing well and doing poorly. 
Um, an advanced democracy has had institutions that in many cases were introduced decades or, or centuries ago. And some of them may not do very well at present. Uh, one of the things that I end up talking about in the book is the Electoral College, um, which was a helpful compromise uh, for certain mechanical aspects of voting in the 18th century uh, that went a long way towards allowing America to stay together pre-Civil War, but which just doesn't make a ton of sense right now. And there's a whole bunch of ways to get rid of the Electoral College, um, which has produced presidents that, that get a minority of votes, uh, a whole bunch of ways that, that don't require a constitutional amendment. But what you actually have to do is sort of start by saying, look, this was a great institution that served us for a while. It's not working now. And maybe it's time to move on. And I think that's actually where advanced democracies are getting. I think they're getting to the point where they realize that these institutions are hard to get rid of because they empower some people and disempower others. And the people who are empowered by them are, are very reluctant to let them change. But this question of how institutions change in an advanced democracy, I think for me, that's one of the hardest and most challenging questions in political science. I want to thank all of you for um, joining with us and engaging on this very challenging uh, and complex topic. I want to reiterate the hopeful note that Ethan's book um, and, and presentation leaves us on in spite of the great complexity of these challenges, that there are lots of developments that have promise and there are lots more on the way. I hope you'll join us on Thursday. I especially want to thank you, Ethan Zuckerman, for sharing your knowledge with us and for um, engaging uh, so delightfully as you always do. So thank you, everyone. There were some questions we didn't get to email them to us and we'll try to answer them. Or Twitter. I'm at Ethan Z on Twitter. I'm happy to talk with you. Jane, thank you so much. And thanks right. for having me. The pleasure. Bye everyone.